Well, I wonder what you make of this statement. How would you react to this statement? British people love to complain. I think it's partly an irrefutable fact, because as soon as you kind of reject it and say, no, that can't be the case, well, are you actually just complaining about it? Um, A survey back in 2019 found that on average, British people spend 10,000 minutes a year complaining about one thing or another. That's around a whole week every single year having a moan and a grumble. The average Brit uh, will have a moan on average three times a day. Maybe you hear that and you think, oh, a bit more for me. And most of the time, always in private. The top 10 most complained about things include, and I imagine you could guess some of these. Number one, bad customer service. Getting cold calls from unknown numbers. People pushing into queues. Waiting for a delivery that doesn't turn up. And of course, the great British weather. And to top it off, the survey also found that 40% of British people regularly complain about the amount that other people regularly complain. You see, Brits love a good moan. And I know that these examples are a little trivial, but I do think the power of complaining is actually ingrained into our culture. You see, I know if I want to get um, a better deal on my broadband, it's not going to do much good to phone up the people at Virgin and compliment them on their lovely service and what a great package I've got. And please, as a result, may I have a lower price. That's not going to happen, is it? I have to phone and I have to complain until I finally get through to the right person and then complain some more and keep complaining until they finally succumb to the pressure and they give me that precious one pound discount that I was so desperately after. Or better still, uh, I have to tweet them. I have to tweet the company that has wronged me and wait for others to hop on the bandwagon until enough pressure finally mounts and I get my refund or whatever it may be. In fact, the very social media industry uh, that is weaved into the fabric of our society is funded by people complaining. Research shows that social media well. Social media companies make their money as people visit and click and scroll. And research has found that people, uh, when they're angry, do more of the clicking and scrolling and swiping. So the whole system is rigged to encourage us to vent and moan and complain. You see, I think it's an irrefutable fact. British people love to complain. But I also think it's a more fundamental issue because it was also a Corinthian problem too. See, right from the start of the letter of 2 Corinthians, uh, it becomes clear that the church in Corinth loved to have a good whinge. And they've taken a swipe at Paul, who's writing this letter to them. As Andy um, helpfully introduced us to last week, the Corinthians have been swayed by some false teachers, uh, the so-called super apostles. These teachers, they, they strut and they swagger and they show off. And their message is one of power and might and live in your best life. And in comparison, Paul just looks a bit weak, and weary, a bit weird, pathetic. Because his message is one of suffering and perseverance. And so they've started to badmouth Paul and follow these false teachers instead. And the beef has got to such a point that Paul had to write to them to address the issue. He mentions it at the end of the passage we read in chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, but that letter didn't really go down well with some So much so, in fact, that he's now had to rearrange his trip to see them as he doesn't want more trouble. So he's written this letter to Corinthians to ensure them that despite his stern words and his change of travel plans, that he still deeply cares for them. And he wants to encourage them to stand firm in Jesus and not be swayed. So in today's passage, I hope we're going to see three things that will help us to stand firm in Jesus. They're quite simple. Firstly, God will keep Paul. Secondly, God will keep his promises. And thirdly, God will keep his people. Hopefully each one will help us see how we might stand firm in Jesus. Well, firstly, God will keep Paul from verses 12 to 17. See, right at the beginning of this section, Paul explains that he's had to change his travel plans because of a situation that's come up elsewhere and because of the hostility he's facing from those in Corinth. He was going to visit them on his way to and from Macedonia so that they might benefit from hanging out and being together twice. Uh, But now he's not going to do that. And the church there has clearly been disappointed to hear this. 
And so they accuse Paul of flip-flopping and not keeping his word. They believe him to be fickle and double-minded, saying someone who says one thing and means another says yes and no in the same breath. They're filing their complaints, uh, hoping for some kind of refund. Remember, the church had been swayed by these so-called super apostles. You see, in their eyes, these false teachers, these impressive-looking teachers, they would never do something like this to them. Like They're the first class when it comes to the teachers. They're emirates. Whereas Paul's rearranging of plans leaves him looking a little like Ryanair. Now, it's a bit harsh. It's really harsh. And it's worth remembering, too, that this letter is sent well before the days of WhatsApp. Uh, it's a letter it would have taken time to travel between uh, where he is in Ephesus uh, to them in Corinth. And situations change uh, and things come up. Yet throughout it all, Paul remains confident that he's only ever acted with integrity and godly sincerity. He's never purposely uh, misled them or tried to manipulate them. Far from it, as we read at the end in verse 4, he wrote to them that of the letter, out of great distress and anguish of heart, with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. He isn't trying to mess them around. No, he loves them. This is a church that he and others helped start and found as they preached a gospel. And just as then he had preached a gospel of grace, he's confident that he's continuing to rely on God's grace and not on earthly wisdom. His actions might not have pleased the Corinthians, but he's listening to God and following his calling. You see, ultimately, Paul cares more about pleasing God than he does about pleasing the Corinthians. And that's because... I think he's got his and their ultimate travel destination in mind. The final stop, as it were. He might look like Ryanair to them, but at least he knows where he's going. He's got him getting off the ground. His eyes are fixed on the day when he will finally meet Jesus again. That's the day of the Lord Jesus, when he returns. That's what's motivating him and why he can say he can boast in the way he's acted. And he hopes that one day too, the Corinthians will be able to boast in him and him in them also. Now, I think we need to be careful uh, and not misunderstand Paul whenever we hear the word boast. I think we immediately hear that uh, negatively. We don't like people who boast. Uh, but I think Paul may be being intentionally provocative, playing off the idea of the boastful super apostles. See, when he says he's boasting, uh, he's not being arrogant his boast is not really in himself and his own abilities, but in the one who he is following and who is working in him and the one that he will meet again one day. His boast is in the grace of Jesus. It is God who's keeping him going, despite the hostility he's facing. It is God who is helping him to make difficult decisions. And it is God who is helping him to speak the truth, even when it's costly, in love and helping him to maintain integrity despite the unjust opposition he's facing. And he hopes his intention is that the Corinthians will be able to boast in the grace of Jesus too. So I think there are two challenges for us here today, straight away, straight off the bat, two challenges uh, with the same solution. Firstly, for leaders, in whatever capacity that might be, whether as leaders in the church, whether an elder, a deacon, uh, of the tech team, youth team, grace growers, whatever it might be, or at work or at home, wherever you lead in some capacity, can you confidently say that you act with integrity and godly sincerity? Do you rely on God or do you rely on your own giftings and wisdom to see you through each day and difficult circumstances? And do you honestly have the best interests of others at heart at all times? Are you able to speak the truth no matter the consequences, but do so in love? The only way I think we'll be able to do that is if our boast is in Christ, if we stand firm in his grace. Otherwise, when times get hard, when those you are leading start to play up, uh, you'll either be crushed and despondent or you'll fly off the handle in despair. You see, 2 Corinthians will show us time and time again that we need leaders who will stand firm in the grace of Jesus, whose confidence is placed solely in Christ. Only then will you be able to face difficult situations like Paul and be able to speak the truth in love even when it's costly. 
Now, I don't know what you make of the phrase to speak the truth in love. I tend to think uh, that that means you get to speak stern words, just put a smile on your face, and that just negates uh, any difficulties that might come your way. Because it's not the case, is it? See, Paul is proof. Speaking the truth is what you ought to do as leaders, but the results won't always be pleasing to you. But you will please God as you speak the truth, as you hold to truth. Standing firm in Jesus means maintaining integrity, holding to the truth, whatever the, whatever the opposition, whether just or unjust. But secondly, I think there's also a challenge for all of us. You see, the deep irony at play here is that it's actually the Corinthians who are the ones who are being fickle, not Paul. It's the church who have turned their mind and attention to more impressive looking leaders. And so they complain and they moan when it seems that Paul has let them down because he dared to challenge them, even though he appears so weak himself. It is them who are being fickle. They aren't acting with integrity and sincerity. And I think that should make us stop and think next time we're tempted to complain about a leader or something we don't quite like about church. Not just how much we might complain, but why. You see, Andy mentioned last week the agony we feel when we hear stories of leaders who have failed and rightly had to step down. Yet the sad reality is that if we were to scroll through the Christian news headlines, wherever we might find them, we would tragically read a plenty of stories of leadership failure, but I doubt we would find many about congregations who have been fickle themselves and got it wrong. That's not in any way to excuse those who have had to write this step down or to quash any whistleblowing or challenges, but it should cause us to stop and think. When I'm tempted to complain, why is that? You see, for the Corinthians, uh, Paul is clear that their grumbling actually belies a more fundamental problem. They are turning from the grace of the gospel. And so the solution is the same for them as it is for him. Uh, he will spell it out in verse 21 when he says, now it is God who makes us and you stand firm in Christ. We must boast in God and stand firm in Christ, which leads to the second point. God will keep his promises. That's verse 18 to 20, 22. Great leaders are great communicators, and great communicators are great leaders, or so the kind of motivational business speak uh, goes. And Paul is confident that he's always communicated with the Corinthians with utter clarity. He's confident because he knows that it has been God who has been working in and through him to minister the grace of the gospel to them. He knows he's been communicating clearly because the gospel itself is clear. And just as God is faithful and unchanging, so his message has remained the same. Whatever his travel plans, wherever he might be going, he has always preached Christ. Not Christ plus anything else, but always Christ alone. That's why Paul can say that the gospel preach, that he preached among them was not yes and no, but in him has always been yes. That is, the gospel has not changed. Christ did not say one thing, but mean another. It has always been clear and has always been unchanging. See, we have to be careful again with this verse. We don't want to misunderstand Paul. I've heard these verses abused in the past, as though it means that we can ask God for anything we want, maybe like a yes day, and the answer will always be yes. Like God is some kind of divine vending machine, giving us whatever treats that we crave. That can't be the case, can it? What he is saying is that all those Old Testament promises that uh, Joe helpfully helped us think about earlier, that God has ever made, uh, are all fulfilled in Christ. All that has been promised by God through the long story of salvation history to restore humanity's relationship with himself, to make a home with his people, to rid them of their sin, has been building towards this great crescendo in Christ. All those sh uh, all those types uh, and shadows in the Old Testament, all the times we see God come good on his word, have been like little, little nods of the head, little mm-hmm, 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 all the way through, building and building until in Christ those mm-hmm become yes. It's like the start of a Mexican wave, kind of building and building until finally Christ uh, comes and the promises are fulfilled. It's a big yes in him, relationship, with God is restored. 
And so in turn, we respond with a great big amen, giving glory to God. See, I think, why, why is Paul bringing this up now? You see, I think the Corinthian tendency to look for stronger leaders, more impressive leaders, actually belies a deeper issue where they're placing their security and their confidence. As you look to those leaders who strut and swagger and seem to offer them more, they're actually turning away from Christ. They're turning away from the very promises of God and seeking security elsewhere. See, Here's the crux of the problem, uh, really, with the false teaching. In promising that Christians ought to be living their best life now, uh, victory every day now, it's not that they're promising too much, uh, they're actually promising far too little. They're denying the very basis of our confidence before God, that salvation has been promised and given to us by Christ and all he has done. What they're espousing is like a mousetrap. The cheese, it looks really tasty. It smells good, but as you approach it, it's actually deadly. So we have to ask the question, where might we be tempted to seek security apart from Christ? And how often do we assume weakness and vulnerability with others out of a desperation to appear stronger and more impressive? I remember um, when I was growing up, when I was part of Da Youth, uh, I would regularly try and bargain with God. Uh, I would make these grand promises, uh, that is, if he would answer my prayers, then I would behave uh, that week, and uh, I would ne- I'd never sin that week if you answer my prayer. I'll be really, really strong. And obviously, I could never um, keep my end of, uh, of the deal, but it did mean that I, started this, I subtly started to think that if I behaved at school and at home, then I would, could come before God expecting, expecting a pat on my back and say, look, surely you'll give me whatever I want now. I would base my confidence before God on the shallow promises I would make to him or my uh, supposed displays of strength that would invariably fail rather than the other way around on his promises to me, on the steadfast, solid promises he makes to us in Christ. Now, Paul says to the Corinthians and to us that he is only able to make that Sorry, Paul says to the Corinthians and to us that only God is able to make us stand firm. It's worth noting too that Paul says in verse 21, he says both us and you. There's a shared answer. Paul appeals to the same grace in his own life that the Corinthians also need. He doesn't have some secret hidden resource that's kept for him as one of the apostles. No, this isn't a con, a kind of one rule for him and another for others. It's a, it's, well, it might be easy to imagine it appears to be for the false teachers. No, he counts himself as a beggar like those in Corinth. He's just a beggar that's found bread and is offering it to other beggars. He's offering people Jesus because in Christ, the salvation is secure and firm. He'll go on, spell that out. He says, Christ has anointed us, set us apart and marked us as his own. Here are those promises fulfilled that God would restore humanity's relationship with himself, make a home of his people and rid us of sin. In him, we are welcomed into the loving embrace of our triune God. Salvation is so secure, in fact, that he gives us his spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come when Jesus returns. Well, the word deposit might lose some of its force to us today. Maybe you think of putting down a deposit on a house that feels like a big scary thing and it could all fall through at any moment anyway. Uh, That's not what Paul is saying here about the spirit. I think it's more like, think of him without depersonalizing too much, think of him like uh, an engagement ring. Uh, He's a loving guarantee of our Savior's love and that one day our Savior will return uh, uh, to gather his bride. That's the kind of security we have in him. Nothing kind of cold and humdrum or insecure. So how silly is it then that we would ever look elsewhere for comfort and security? See, to stand firm in Jesus means trusting that our salvation is secure in him. Which leads uh, to my final point. Got the right page. God will keep uh, his people. Um, we've seen God will keep Paul, God will keep his promises. Finally, uh, and this is a note we'll finish on, God will keep his people till the end. And the whole sermon, if you take nothing away, the whole sermon could be summarized as God will keep his church because he keeps his promises. 
Oops. And just to be clear, uh, the idea of being kept um, isn't something restrictive like, like a cat in a cage or anything like that. No, it's more like the embrace of a loved one, that sense of being safe and secure. In fact, Paul says that part of the reason he didn't return, uh, he's not going to return to the church in Corinth, was only to increase that sense for them. He didn't want to cause any more aggro or undue distress or seem like he was trying to lord it over them or shame them. Though Paul has always had the Corinthian joy, the Corinthians joy in mind. He repeats it twice. The faith that God gives us, uh, gives us to help us stand firm overflows in joy. Despite all that the Corinthians have put him through, despite all the accusations they are caught, uh, they're throwing his way, Paul says that he's always been working for their joy. That's what he's had in mind. And what a picture of the gospel that is. You see, the Corinthian condition is ultimately a human one. It was Francis Schaeffer that said, humanity's rebellion began with a lack of a thankful heart. Instead of responding to the good gifts that God has given us with thanks and praise, instead, we turn in on ourselves, complaining that we don't have enough, don't have what we need, and we fester and we stew with selfful disdain towards the very God who made us and sustains us. With the very breath that God has given us, we grumble and we complain towards him and about others. But what does God do in return? Well, he sends his son, the one who never grumbled or complained on the way to the cross. But for the joy set before him, hung there for you and me, the greatest act of weakness we could possibly imagine to secure salvation for you and I, for all those who would trust in him. So what are we to do? We're to place our faith, uh, to boast in the one who bled for us, who ensures us of the Father's love and gives us his spirit as a guarantee of his return. We are to respond with a great big thankful amen to the glory of God. Joy and thankfulness should overflow from our hearts and our lives. You see, I think this is the antidote to the power of complaints. Um, someone once said that resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. And I think that's right. Cynicism is cyanide to the soul. But what's the opposite to complaining? Well, it's rejoicing in the life-giving grace of God rather than grumbling, responding in thankful faith. God will keep his people to the end. So standing firm in Jesus means exchanging cynicism for thankfulness and experiencing the joy that flows from faith. See, what difference uh, might it make to our lives individually and as a church uh, and to the watching world around us if we were known as people who shunned our culture of complaining and instead lived lives of uh, joyful lives of thanks and praise to God. As people met us, what if they didn't meet a cynicism and a coldness and a, a grumbling and complaining? What if the British weather wasn't the first thing on our lips? Uh, but thanks to God for all that he has given us. So as we finish, I think there's a little test maybe we can do uh, today. Uh, when you get home and you sit down for your lunch uh, and someone asks you, um, how did you find church this morning? Maybe take note of the, your initial response. What does your gut uh, want to first say? Do you tend to answer maybe like me? Like, you know, yeah, it, it was all right. Sermon was a bit, bit long. Uh, other than that, uh, the words didn't quite come up at the right time. Uh, there was a bit of a crackly noise. He dropped, he dropped the words on the page. Ah, do you remember that? What is your gut reaction? See, all the things that, you know, they're things that we want to be good, okay? We, we want those things to be good. Of course we do. But is that our starting point? Do we start with complaints? Is that our gut reaction to, gum, to grumble? Or is our gut response to delight in the gospel? How was church this morning? Well, we met with God. We heard from him as we opened his word. We rejoiced together and worshipped him. I wonder what his spirit is speaking to us today. Wouldn't that be great if that was our gut reaction? See, do we overflow with thankfulness? Well, God will keep his church because he keeps his promises. So stand firm in the grace of Jesus. Lead with integrity. Trust, the salva trust that salvation is secure and he experienced the joy of faith. Shall I pray? 
Father, thank you that you are our good God. Thank you for sending Christ for us uh, and giving us your spirit. Thank you that you have secured uh, everything for us, everything that we need uh, for salvation and a life of godliness. Father, I do pray, uh, trust that you've been speaking to us today for your word. Pray that you would seal it in our hearts, that we'd act upon it. Father, by your spirit, stir us uh, uh, to live lives of integrity, to live lives that are confident in Christ, uh, and to live lives that overflow with thankfulness. Father, we thank you for all that you've done. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen.